I don't believe in progress. I don't. People sometimes look a bit shocked when I say this. But why? It's not self-evident that humans have progressed in some absolute sense. That doesn't mean everything was perfect once and we're all going to hell in a handbasket. But pick a subject and you'll find some things are better, while other things have become worse. If you're going to believe in progress, you have to define what you mean. More stuff, more freedom, less disease. Pick any subject and you'll find that what looks from one vantage point like progress mostly seems that way because you're ignoring the costs. We've grown immeasurably richer and more comfortable in the last 300 years. But we did so on the backs of plundered, colonised and enslaved peoples, and at the cost of incalculable environmental degradation. Meanwhile, torture in warfare hasn't gone away. Warfare hasn't gone away. Nor has hunger, misery, want or human degradation. Is this progress in some absolute sense? You have to define your terms and exclude some costs as irrelevant to progress. And as soon as you do that, you have, as the lawyers say, begged the question. That is, you've rigged the game by assuming the truth of what you set out to prove. Regardless, the world is full of people who really fervently believe in progress. You can be upset, you can be angry, but it's still only going in one direction. For our purposes here, the key is to notice the underlying structure belief, that there exists a kind of axis along which progress can be measured, from more bad to less bad. Confusingly, this is often accompanied by the sense that even though the movement from more bad to less bad is supposedly unstoppable, it also demands constant life or death defence against the forces of reaction. My starting premise is that this structure is a belief, not a fact. There is this recurring trope among conservative writers that modernity is all about feminization. I think there is some truth to it that a highly technological culture seems to be one that reduces the need for brute physical labour and also increasingly forecloses the possibility of violence as a, as a, as a means of resolving conflict. And in, that, in those particular respects it has, a very, it has a feminizing effect in the sense that it flattens the distinction between the sexes in terms of who can do what job. Um, obviously, there's no, there's no very clear reason why I shouldn't do a, a spreadsheet monkey job just as well as any man. But the same is the, the, the inverse is obviously not true for you know demanding you know onerous physical work in the fields or, or on an oil rig. Right. Um, so there's a um, so so there's a feminising effect on the on the work on the workforce in that sense, and also I mean as it, I've put it quite flippantly before by saying the atom bomb cucked everybody. You know, in, in a sense, the, 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 the phenomenon of mutually assured destruction, you know, precedes a huge amount of the, the cyborg and uh, digital and biotech era phenomena that we're grappling with today. And I think that in a way that I think Paul Virilio is quite insightful mm -hmm. on, in that he, 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 situates, he, he situates our entry into the... the order we're in now very much with the arrival of the atom bomb because mm -hmm. um, on, on a sort of macro scale uh, mutually assured destruction um, it, mutually assured destruction is at the sort of geopolit geopolitical level you know not dissimilar to um, the, 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 the sort of en endless talking with no possibility of resolution through violence that you see on the internet which to me is a is, is sort of forcing all of social interaction into what used what what have been historically very much more feminine forms um, because fisticuffs are just literally not possible on the internet. In, and at a geopolitical level, fisticuffs are, you know, not impossible, but extremely unwise under mutually assured destruction, because, you know, it could just go really, really, really hideously wrong. Well, um, may maybe this is why modern warfare seems to be based on uh, the, the use of combatants to attack civilians rather than... Right, 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 right. Right, right. I, I, yeah, it's, it's, become, it's, become very, it's become as much something which is um, contested in, uh, in, in the discursive space, in the media space, as it is in the warfare happens in the, in the media space as much as it does in, in, in real life. Um, but but ju just to finish that thought about the feminization of the world, um, it, it isn't a wholesale uh, feminization in the sense um, uh, that I think, you know, th there are some sort of crudely stereotypical um, 
versions of the complementarian story that make relationality, um, the, that situate relationality very much in the feminine, um, which, which I actually think is a mistake. Because I mean, in terms, if you're talking about fisticuffs, you know, if you're talking about a fight in a pub car park, that's very much a form of relationality. You know, there's a, yeah. and I mean, you know, here we, here we are with two. We, we've got two dogs accompanying us today, um, whose whose job. Um, historically, these these two, I believe, are both pets. Um, certainly, Safi is not a gun dog, but they're, 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 the 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 historic job of both of these breeds is as hunting dogs. Sure. Um, there's a the, the Im implicitly they have a whole history of, of bloodthirstiness with them, and I think there's a whole there's a whole e moral and social ecology um, very much belonging to the countryside that understands vi violence in very much relational terms as something which is just part of the natural order, and and there's a there's a, the, and that there's an intimacy in in the hunt in the predator prey relationship, which is not detached or clinical in the way, for example, factory farming is, and I come back a lot to the to the the different kind of violence. Um, that, that's the, the fact that we haven't. I mean, this is this is very much you know sort of relates to what I say when I when I what I mean when I say I don't believe in progress. Um, we have not, in fact, in any way you know to any in any meaningful sense, reduced the absolute amount of animal cruelty we perpetrate. Oh. You know, as we've things you know, it. you know we've we've abolished we've banned um, fox hunting, but but in but but we've you know that that amount of arbitrary and sort of sporting animal cruelty has been replaced by by these sort of fear factories. Of you know the the industrial manufacture of meat, um, you know in, with, in, with complete disregard to, but, but to to the sentience of the animals involved. But this comes back to a, a question about the way the way our thought patterns are shaping our behaviour. Because it, it seems to me that one of the things that's very very um, specific about the way we farm now and the way that we procure our food is that look when you go into a supermarket the chicken on a line of identical looking plastic covered chickens yep. is it's not a chicken it's just chicken it's just, there's, there's yeah. no particularity yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, there yep. as you know i like hunting and deer stalking and doing all of that sort of thing so if you like we can just talk about this for hours i'll be very <laughs> happy but one of the things that one finds particularly in deer stalking the the particularity of the creature mm. becomes a absolutely the focus of one's attention. Mm. It ceases to be just an instance of its species kind, mm. and mm -mm. it becomes this creature this particular that is, one. That is yep. free and in its environment and is about to be kind of sacrificed to the cosmic order of, of death and regeneration. And... And uh, and you suddenly become very worried. You know, you you want to take the cleanest hit possible. I would probably argue that what's what what's attacked by the kind of the technological or the managerial order um, is not either the masculine or the or the feminine as such particularly, but the idea of relationality as yeah. such, which can be expressed in different forms, including sex, including violence, including the the love between you know the family members and, yeah. and so on and so forth. You know, there are infinite forms of relationality up to and including the very intimate ones in warfare or in hunting um, you know and some of which are more masculine or feminine coded depending on context um, but but all, all of which are all of which are enmeshed in re literally matters of life and death so, um, uh, um, and, and, and all of that all of that is rendered abstract clinical detached and um, sort of standardized yeah. under the technological order I would be inclined to go down uh, the path of, of explaining this stuff as an ongoing process of depersoning of human beings, um, and I think that you that you also see this in the growing aesthetic, right? I mean, this idea of uh, I, I can't remember the name of the clothes store that used to have kind of men with bulging muscles standing outside in underpants and things. This idea that you can you, you, what you want is an instance of the kind with a certain aesthetic vision. What you what you don't want is the particular. You don't you don't. Oh, <laughs> I thought it was a Chinese water deer. Um, I was just thinking, where's Safi gone? Yeah. Uh, and yes, in the sense that it represents part of a you know much bigger picture of sort of terraforming people's inner lives. Um, which which I think is is kind of what you're talking about, or it's related to what you're talking about. Um, which is it's an unavoidable effect of um, of the the digital memeplex, which sort of re it renders visible um, 
it, it sort of it, it's, it's a it, it has a dynamic you know making everything radically transparent or seeming to make everything radically transparent in a way which implies that there's nothing which should not be radically transparent mm -hmm. um, with, uh, which in turn I mean I, I think about I think about people some some distance more native more net native than me and some distance younger than me who don't draw a very clear distinction between what they post and what's and what they don't you know there's there's no sense in the same way that there are some things which you just shouldn't share um, go, go into that a little more um, I mean this, these are these are extreme examples this isn't this isn't any for everybody by any stretch but I mean there are I, I, you know, Zuma age people who who literally share the most exact de the, the most intimate details of dates that they're on pretty much while they're on the dates yeah. or you know make make TikToks of you know, Make, make TikToks of the person they're actually on a date with while they're doing it, and pretty much upload it while the date is still ongoing. Wow! Right, I know. I mean, <laughs> and I think, I, I, and, and to me, to me, that seems that, that that seems very radically disrespectful of the of the private space, yeah. which you're surely in the process of, you know, see, exploring whether yeah. or not you want to cultivate with yeah. another person. But you know, this is but, but the fact that this is happening suggests that not that not everybody sees it like that. Um, and this is the, this, I think, is a big generational shift in terms of the, you know, the sort of very basic understanding of what's inside and what's outside, what's public and what's private, which you know, suggests. Although, I mean, this is a this is only a hypothesis for me at the moment, but it, it, it suggests that it's possible. Um, it, it, it suggests the possibility that, that, that there are that there are people for whom inner life just isn't really a thing, or, I mean, or, to, or to, to nothing like as great an extent as, as would be the case if your main mode of engaging with ideas was through reading in private, in quiet and in so, silence. So it's technologically driven, this. Yeah, and I mean it's you know this, it's fairly well established from you know writing and thinking about the the, the, the cultural and psychological impact of the print era and of deep literacy. That how we read, how we engage with information, you know, has a huge effect. Has had massive, far, wide re wide ranging impacts on um, how people, what people thought a person was. You know, pre, an, an oral culture has a completely different understanding of, what, of, of how memory works, sure. you know, what history is, um, what, what, even, what, even what a person is, sure. uh, what, you know, or, what, or, what, or, what, or, or of an inner life as such to a literate culture. Yeah. Um, and and, and the, the information revolution we're going through is so, is so radical again, a change from the print revolution, that I think we're seeing, we're seeing changes on an equivalent level. For my sins, I sat and listened the other day to a live stream between Tate and Lawrence Fox, where they were talking about the recent brouhaha over some, some opinions that Lawrence Fox articulated on GB News and was defenestrated for. Um, and what really struck me, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not going not to engage with, the, with that in any depth, but what really struck me about the, the things that they were saying were that they were not, they were not particularly internally coherent. Yeah. Um, but that it, but that in terms of what was going on there, it didn't really matter, because what they were what they were offering the product which they were offering wasn't um, a, a coherent philosophy. It was a, it was an attitude of mind. Sure. It was a sort of predisposition to see the world in a certain way. Yeah. And it actually didn't matter if if things that they said at different points didn't really make sense. Um, on the one hand, um, I mean, they it was it was expressed by one or the other of them at one point that women are are better than men at caring and nurturing. It was also expressed and agreed by both of them at another point that it was unfair that women get get child custody in a majority of divorce cases. <laughs> and I'm thinking, well, you can't really have it both ways, but it doesn't matter. This yeah. is the point. Is the point is it doesn't matter from from the perspective. Of you know of offering as a product a boutique worldview, it doesn't matter if the if the worldview itself is full of contradictions, because it's it's the it's the disposition it's the mental disposition it which is a frustration that the viewers right, themselves feel. right right exactly and it doesn't matter if it's full of if if, if it doesn't really add up on the dog. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so and and there are and, and Tate is by no means you know there are there are a thousand there are countless boutique worldviews and, the, and, the, and there's a real competition at the moment for um, people putting themselves forward as sort of curators of boutique worldviews um, in, a, in a kind of content or media or discursive landscape which is, which is increasingly sort of you know, pumped full at the, out, at the outer edges of automatically generated content. And in a sense, um, th there's a real need for people who are capable of filtering some kind of a coherent narrative for those who just don't have time to do it themselves or aren't internet obsessive enough to do it for themselves. And, so, and to so, what degree yeah. do you think that this is deliberately orchestrated 
Um, I mean, I, I, I know that, that you tend to immediately bolt when anyone walks into conspiratorial territory with you, which um, I'm going to try and provoke you to be more conspiratorial uh, today. But um, to what degree do you think this is deliberately orchestrated because it is, uh, it pays well, it gets more views, it's, um, you know, I mean, I, I've noticed this with people like uh, Piers Morgan, uh, for whom I don't have a, an overly high regard. Um, uh, you know that the, the desire to actually develop a constructive conversation um, by which people might be able to understand their situation better that's not a high priority what what he wants and what people like him or organizations like his want is two people with already established opposing views who will not agree on anything and just let them like a dog fight just go at each other right it makes great content yeah um, i mean i think uh, my, my general stance on conspiracy theories is, is that they're all true but usually allegorically rather than literally an effect can be produced by a set of incentives without without the need for a, for a malign intelligence to be or orchestrating them um, you know, but people people manage to people manage to mess the world up all on their own without without the need for um, you know lizard people from outer space you know making well, it even I know. worse. But people also, um, when they agree with each other, make plans together and don't necessarily tell everyone those plans, uh, which is a conspiracy. Uh, but it's what people do naturally. Uh, I mean, do and, uh, do I but do I think it's do I think it's likely that Piers Morgan deliberately, you know, or, or the the producers of Piers Morgan's show deliberately set out to um, create an adversarial dynamic because it sells better? Probably, yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, you know, that's sure, not that's sure. not a very that, that's not, not a very, very sophisticated. It, conspiracy. It, it's not a very controversial no. thing. You know, if you if you've ever if you've met any um, media producers in that in that corner of the media, um, it's, it, it doesn't seem like a very controversial thing to say. No. Um, Safi, come. Well, everybody looks sweets all around. Um, so I don't I don't know that I'd even really class that as a conspiracy theory. What what one ends up doing by taking that position is saying. Well, there are all of these people who are deeply disturbed uh, by uh, currents in the world, and really, they're just very unsophisticated. Uh, oh, not a, not at all. Who, uh, I mean, that's uh, that that would be. And that, I, that's I need to come along and interpret. What no, 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 no. This is only if you. That, that, that's only true if you think that understanding things allegorically is an inferior form of thinking to understanding things, you literally. know, cognitively and literally and intellectually. Mm. Which I, I actually think it's the other way around. Yeah, <laughs> quite the opposite. Um, you know, it, it, just because you, just because you think it, it, it's it's not a it's not a form of consciousness which is very widespread now, um, but being able to toggle back and forth between a, a, a poetic and, if you like, a rational uh, way of looking at the world, um, it's absolutely a superpower as things stand. I think it's completely a mistake to, think, to see the allegorical mode as, as lower in order. You know, pretty much every every theology or every every. <laughs> Every form of theology or mysticism you care to name, you know, in in previous eras to our own, would have would have ordered them the other way around. Um, yes, but so, but, you, but but you step in and give the literal interpretation of their metaphor. We are where we are, right? Mm. <laughs> you know, we are. This is we, we live in the world we live in. You know, as a journalist, there's not there's not a whole lot of point in speaking speaking in terms that make no sense to the everyday people. <laughs> You know, at the end of the day, I have to write for the I have to write for a readership. Sure. Um, otherwise, what, what's what, what's even the point? Yeah, yeah. Okay, fine. Um, should we should we start wandering back to the? Car? Yeah, I think that's probably a good okay. idea. It's nearly noon. And it's not going to yeah. get long before we get peckish. Is he waterproof? Do they have the no, whippets are not double coated, are they? No. 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 I mean, he really feels the cold. Yeah, I imagine, I imagine he doesn't like rain very much. Doesn't like rain. Doesn't, doesn't like rain. Water. Yeah. In fact, doesn't really like anything except the sofa. <laughs> Tuck in. Yeah. Um, 
Mary? Yes. Are you a doomer? Uh, <laughs> uh, yes, yes and no. Do I believe we're doomed to extinction as a species anytime soon? Probably not. Mm. Um, do I think this civilization um, is, is sort of on its uppers? Um, for reasons inherent to our civilization, probably yes. I think that's what Duma means. Mm. You know, people have thought this before and yet here we still are. I had a sort of not dissimilar conversation with, I can't even remember why I was at a conservative drinks party in, uh, in, in Bedford. But it was, this was, this was some, <laughs> some years ago and I, I can't even remember what I was doing that. But anyway, there I was talking to some kind of you know, hoary, red-trousered Bedford Conservative <laughs> at, a, at a Conservative drinks party. And I expressed my view that, you know, the sort of, you know, the, the various structural forces leading, leading us towards sort of total civilizational collapse. And he, said, he, he sort of, he stopped and thought for a minute. He was like, you have to remember, Mary, when, when, you, read some, when you read Gibbon or something like that, that it all happened a lot, you know, it, comes, it, it seems like it all happened very quickly if you read Gibbon, but actually it took a very long time. And there were plenty of people over the course of the collapse of the Roman Empire who led pretty pleasant and peaceful lives. Sure. But it, isn't that what a lot of people are claiming at the moment? And, and I think you're among them who are, who are taking a broader, um, a, a, a broader historical analysis and saying, look, this kind of rapid decline of civilization that a lot of people are talking about, that they're observing in the West, isn't simply a post-war thing. That there's been, you know, you have to understand the Industrial Revolution, you have to go before then, you have to understand what the Reformation was about, you have to understand the Enlightenment and rationalism and romanticism and sentimentalism and all of the, you have to understand this long journey of decline, which of course uh, naturally so, so, makes so you, you think, into a medievalist. You think it's all, you think it's all, all down, uh, presumably you, Sebastian Morello, think it's all downhill from the, from the theses nailed to the door in Wittenberg? Um, um, and it's just, just everything's just been going pear shaped since. I don't then. know. I pin or, or perhaps the invention of the printing press. I mean, I pin yeah. a lot more on the Enlightenment. Yeah. I, I am sort of of the view that if you look for the the moment at which decline began, you mm. you sort of have to deal with the snake in the garden and the. Yeah. <laughs> it's all right. It's all, it's all been downhill since the fall. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. I mean, if you're going to be if you're going to be that radical about it, then I think you just have to you just have to have hope. On the you? on the other hand, though, that there, there are if you do think that human nature is contending with a kind of innate fallenness, <laughs> then you have different civilizational models for how you're going to right. negotiate that no, and deal right. with that. And I think that, that in our own age, we deal with that in an extremely immature and silly and short-sighted way. No, that doesn't help. In the grand sense, do I, uh, am I a doomer in the sense, do, do I think there's, there's all, no, no, nothing's ever gonna get any better? Well, I, I don't really believe in progress, so that's sort of, that, that's kind of academic. Um, so what does that, that mean? I mean, I mean Doomerism is built into your it, world view? It's a, a low-key pessimistic um, view on, on the, how, how the, whether things are going to get better or worse in, in the grand yeah. scheme of things, I guess, yeah. Um, but, I mean, in terms of, in slightly more concrete, slightly less kind of world historical terms, um, nobody has yet succeeded in decoupling economic growth from energy throughput, and I don't think they will. You know, there are, there are various attempts afoot at the moment. But if you, if, you, if you start to drill down into what people mean by progress in the contemporary sense, yeah, not in the theological sense or, or you know, le leaving all of that aside for a moment, but if you, you know, in the more contemporary sense, what people are generally referring to when they talk, to, when they talk about progress is, is various effects depend in, in different fields of um, economic growth. Yeah. You know, more, more technology, more stuff. Um, yeah. You know whether that's reduced infant mortality or people having you know easier, easier you know, better standards of living. You know broadly speaking, it's better. It's, it's you know an improved standard of living is what people mean by progress in the sort of popular demotic sense. And and from that perspective, um, it seems pretty. It seems pretty clear to me that what people mean when they mean by progress is is all downstream of increased energy throughput, which is to say it's all downstream of burning more fossil fuels. And eventually, <laughs> all the fossil fuels are going to run out. And nobody has yet come up with a way of decoupling energy throughput from, effectively, from progress. So when the fossil fuels run out, so does progress. And okay, but that's that's not that's not the the only model of progress with which people are working. People are increasingly very sceptical of the notion of infinite growth and that infinite 
uh, economic growth is actually the thing that's unwinding our civilization. And so they talk about civilizational progress. You know, what does it mean to to capitalize on on learning, on taking seriously our cultural inheritance? You say that, or they pe people say that, um, but you watch the class conflicts Cheers, that will. Man. Cheers. Um, you know, watch the class conflicts that will unfold when people start trying to make that case to the pe to, to, to the masses. You know, good luck with that. Go on. Is all I'm saying. Expand the thought. Uh, we only have to look at you know, arguments which are which are afoot at the moment about uh, things like uh, th things such as 15-minute cities or you know policies which are effectively top-down. What they really are is top-down measures designed to restrict the freedom of the masses yep. in order to reduce energy throughput. Yep. That's, that's, what's, that's fundamentally what's going on. Um, and, and presumably the bigger picture desire is to reduce energy thro throughput overall um, in, order, in, order to keep, in order to keep the show on the road for a bit longer, or possibly forever, nobody really knows. Um, yeah, but if, if those arguments were being made by progressives um, in, in a kind of with a kind of Poundbury model of what a 15-minute city would look like, where we're going to invest heavily in classical architecture and local communities and people doing things together and knowing each other. But it seems to be being peddled by precisely the people who want to tra transition into purely virtual relationships, who want a kind of, um, you know, m medical-based um, totalitarian state. Right, absolutely. <laughs> and that's I mean, why I'd, people you distrust know, I'd be, it. I'd, I'd be considerably less suspicious of the proposal if if people if, you know if instead of saying oh climate change we need everything to be walkable we were saying well okay go, let, let's let, let's put everything into building more doctor surgeries and schools and shops locally let's totally deregulate businesses under a certain turnover threshold so mm -hmm. that people can create so that shops and local businesses can re-emerge organically um, such that people don't have to walk everywhere anymore. But, but, but what's happening instead is people are saying, no, actually what we need to do is we need to in introduce, we need to build, instead of spending money on GP surgeries, we're going we're, we're to put money into building CCTV infrastructures um, that will monitor how, how often you leave your designated area in your car. <laughs> to which the response is, is two words long and not very polite. <laughs> no, so, I mean, I but, um, you know, there, there, are, there are times when I wonder how much, you know, sooner or later it's going to come to a very much more open and direct class conflict. Because at the end of the, you know, fundamentally what this boils down to is, you know, I don't know, in my, again, in my more, in my more doomerish moments, I think this is about, um, you know, an, an elite class that wants to preserve the current order for a bit longer. Um, they just don't, you know, for themselves, and don't massively care how much they impact on the positive aspects of the of the current order for everybody else. If if the if the net effect is that it, it who who cares? Who cares if everybody else has to be locked into their particular zone in Oxford? As if if, Bill, if it means Bill Gates can go on flying his private jet around right. the world. So there's there's the hypocrisy of it all. Mm. But, but I mean, you know, you could make you could you could make the 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 the, the right wing aristocratic case for um, restricting air travel to to an elite once again that's that's sure. very much more the sort of bronze age pervert yeah you know if you if you were going to do br bronze age pervert environmentalism that's probably what it would look like yes <laughs> yeah i think so yeah um and the bug man from flying <laughs> but, but the the interesting thing is that in this uh, book that i'm well i say i'm writing i'm supposed to be writing um uh, oh. it's taking me longer than it ought to uh, in in this uh, in this book, I, I home in on this study that was done by four sociologists about um, various ways to analyse the rise and fall of happiness or how people identify uh, mm. being happy in their lives. And what's really interesting is that the access to universal healthcare and hospitals and things like this, the things you mentioned, has coincided with a massive drop in happiness. Now, it's not to say that there's a causal relationship between the two. It's simply to say that that's not sufficient to have the rise in happiness. Mm -hmm. What seems to be, from every analysis, the thing from which people derive happiness is twofold. Local friendships and loyalties and some kind of religious affiliation mm -hmm. are the two things that give people a sense of that meaning. That sounds about right. And, and if, if in order to pursue uh, rising material standards, you need to wage more or less explicit war on all of those things, then sooner or later something is going to give. 
That sounds yeah. quite doomerish. <laughs> I mean, you, you, I mean, in, in, in terms of in terms of the next, you know, the, the prognosis for this this particular um, iteration of our civilization, um, I, I'm not I'm not massively optimistic in terms of the prognosis for the human species overall. I'm pretty optimistic. Sure. I mean, I think the the, the human species is very is very flexible and very adaptable. And at the end of the day, I mean, if you wanted to be really brutal about it, you could say that uh, the, the fertility crisis is, is just nature, nature, nature is healing. You know, this, if techno-capital is structurally anti-natalist, then eventually it's techno- you know, the, those, who, those who lean into that particular civilizational order are just going to select themselves out of the gene pool. And what will, what will survive them, the, 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 the human culture and the human ecologies that will survive, um, will be those that somehow developed an immunity. To, yeah. to, to that particular you know, ideology. I mean, when, when conservative-minded people get worried about the demographic crisis, they know that there are certain populations in the world that are actually rapidly growing. What they really mean is there's a demographic crisis in the West. Yep. And it's because they think, and I think probably rightly, that the West was traditionally a kind of treasury of civilization. That the Mediterranean Europe was a was a sort of you know it was the cradle of Greek wisdom and Roman law and Christianity and the national identity and all of these things. And that if those if the nations that that comprise that civilization just kind of commit demographic suicide, then you might seriously lose a kind of accumulated wisdom. I think that's what they're arguing. Which, are, which, is, which is probably true, or, you know, it's, it's foreseeable, it's, it's imaginable, certainly. Um, I mean, I've, I've argued before that the, the, the so-called Great Replacement is not, in fact, an elite conspiracy. It's a side effect. You know, it's, it's happening in the sense that, um, you know, an increasing proportion of most Western nations is, is formed of people who weren't born in those countries. Yeah. But, but what's going on there isn't some sinister conspiracy co- cooked up in a smoke-filled room by Klaus Schwab or whoever. Um, it's simply a, a side effect of the need to increase populations in order to increase economic growth because our, our entire economic order is predicated on never-ending growth. Yeah. Um, plus um, the great lack of self-replacement. Mm-hmm. You know, and, what, and if you put those two things together, people are not people are not self-replacing, and but we but we need bums on seats. I mean, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? You have well, to you, you have to put you need bums on seats. Well, Camus, who who came up with this idea of the Great Replacement, who I think is in his nineties, mm-hmm. he said recently in an interview that, that we published at the European Conservative, you know, actually, um, I'm not I'm not trying to to give you the cause of the Great Replacement. That's not, that's not what my thesis is. What I'm trying to do is just describe what's happening anyway. It's a purely descriptive mm. account, which isn't how he's always been presented by no. those who no. dislike him. No, um, I mean, he's, a, he's a controversial figure, yeah, I think yeah, it's yeah, fair to sure, say. For sure, for sure. Um, so, I think Mr. Taffy's eating a napkin. <laughs> um, uh, so this, is, this is what dogs do. Yeah, exactly. Eat. So, uh, and, and, and as all of this unravels and the technology escalates, people are increasingly concerned that technology is going to be used as a coercive means, or is at the moment. Uh, that's clearly true. Um, that's, that's very, you know, I mean... How far do you think that can go? Um, well, I mean, I think... Uh, well, how, how, I, I, hesitate to, I hesitate to speculate, because I think, I think the answer is probably quite socially and culturally... Uh, specific, um, in the sense that you know the the technologies are what they are, and what people to you know, how different polities um, apply them will depend a lot on the local local sociocultural context. I mean, if you but isn't localism disappearing? Um, there are obvious differences between how how America or Britain, for example, applies surveillance technologies compared to how China applies surveillance sure. technologies. Um, you know, it, they are essentially the same technologies, um, but there are there are local nuances in terms of how they're received and in what and what people are willing to accept. They and converge. What are willing to, but 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 will they will they converge completely? I think sure. probably not, um, because uh, there are. I mean, un- unless unless you unless you did succeed in completely replacing the population of the West, including its entire cultural tradition, which seems a tall order and that's not something that anybody would actually set out to do. Because I mean, why would you? Um, you've, you, you've got to contend with a, a long, a, a, an extremely long established and extremely deeply rooted uh, tradition of giving, giving due regard to the, to the human individual 
um, which which has pros and cons, you know, as we both probably agree, um, but which is which has incredibly deep roots and, and you know come and, and expresses itself in countless different ways, including um, in, including fairly robust pushback mm-hmm. um, against against being being managed by surveillance technologies. I mean, I think just recently we were talking a little bit before about ULES. They've been setting up the ULES cameras all around outer London and, and, and people have just been going around taking them down again. And people are shinning up the poles, vandalising them, you know, <laughs> smashing them to pieces and, you know, with, with something, you know, a balaclava on and just disappearing again. And, you know, presum- and I can promise you that's not the English middle class population of London. I mean, who, who knows who it is? You know, you know these are the, 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 fine, the fine upstanding yeoman'ry of Britain is, mm. is responding in the way that the, the, the yeomanry of Britain normally responds to <laughs> unacceptable incursions on, on the freedom of the English citizen. <laughs> well, you that, are and far is, more optimistic than I thought this, you were, right? It, the, and, the, and this is not the first time the yeomanry of Britain yeah. has responded in that way. Yeah. I mean, you know, absolute monarchy has always been a, a, a complicated question in Britain, well before, well before we beheaded any monarchs, <laughs> um, but for much the same reason. You know, you have to keep, you have to at least keep the robber barons on side and arguably the peasant, peasantry as well, because, you know, absolute monarchy is never that, never completely absolute, it just isn't. Uh, and uh, I mean, I'm not, I'm, I'm not hugely familiar with Chinese culture, but it is my understanding that they just take a very different view towards um, the the sanctity of the individual. Which is not to say that you know human person has no meaning at all there. I, I couldn't speculate on that. But Chinese people are just you know just less wedded to the idea that you know I, I as an individual is the is the primary unit of anything. As far as I can make out, like Chinese surveillance culture is actually quite popular. You know, and this is something, you know, where pe- people in the West are fond of looking at videos of, you know, the, the, the public shaming of, crim- love of criminals or whatever in, in Chinese society. And they oh my God, you know, how appalling this must be for the poor Chinese people. But as far as I can make out, they, they don't, you know, it's not, it, they don't hate it nearly as much as we would is the point. <laughs> and, you know, there are, there, and there are lots of people there who just think, well, this is, this is actually quite a good way of maintaining an orderly and peaceful society. Now, I'm sure... I'm sure there are people who, who do absolutely hate it over there. And I would also be willing to bet that those, the people who do absolutely hate it in China are the ones who will get airtime in the West um, for, again, the, the re- reasons of cultural difference. The Chinese have undergone a long process of uh, dehumanisation, uh, of which the common Chinese person has been, uh, you know, a very serious victim. And the one-child policy is a kind of obvious example of this. And, and, and the thing is that, you know, now that's been lifted, why are the Chinese not having more children? Well, it's because if you're coerced into a habit for long enough, you, you, you end up conceding the moral territory and you take on the habit voluntarily. But I'm not sure that's necessarily where we want to go, is it? I, don't, I, I mean, I'd be, I'd be a little bit cautious about applying a term like dehumanisation to a culture that doesn't have a tradition of, that doesn't have a, a, a deep-rooted Christian tradition. Mm. I, I mean, it's, it, it's it, you know, from, from a Christian vantage point, you know, human personhood is universal. Um, but but that's, that's from a Christian vantage point, and there are a great many vantage points other than the Christian one that just don't take the same view and don't see human persons in the same way at all. Um, and I think, I, I, again, I'm not familiar enough with the, the ins and outs of um, Chinese discussion on this, but, you know, for, for, for a culture that doesn't have a, long, a deep-rooted Christian tradition, I'm, I'm just not sure that, that dehumanisation, you know, applies in quite the same way. Well, we tried it in the Soviet terror. Right, right, I'm, we're, uh, along with along with a concurrent program of dechristianisation, yeah, you know, yeah. of necessity, yeah, yeah, because yeah. the two the two very much yeah, go together. Sure, sure. Um, I'm, I'm going to wait until the main course comes, and then I'm going <laughs> to launch into rewilding sex, <laughs> which I think is just a polite lunchtime conversation. <laughs> How do we rewild sex? Uh, um, the phrase rewilding sex, um, I, I borrowed from, well, well really, I'm, I'm drawing an analogy there um, with rewilding natural landscapes, which is something that gets talked about a lot 
Sure. Um, in environmentalist circles. And, that, and the idea with rewilding is that um, you, you can restore the natural harmony or you can restore the harmony of a, an ecological system mm. um, more, more successfully, so sometimes by reintroducing an apex predator. And, and the example I gave in the book, Feminism Against Progress, was um, a, a, a very powerful video that I saw a, a while ago about what happened when they reintroduced wolves to, Nash to Yellowstone mm. National Park in the United States. Um, and they suddenly got this biodiversity <laughs> that they weren't expecting. And, and what did happen um, was incredibly complex. Yeah. And, it, and it's, it's a powerful film because it serves as, a, as an illustration of how intricate ecological systems are. Yeah. Um, I, I can't remember all of the stages, but um, it, as a consequence of reintroducing wolves to Yellowstone National Park, a river changed course. The wolves ate some more of the deer, which meant that the deer changed their changed their behaviour in terms of their grazing patterns. And because of that, different shrubberies grew, mm -hmm. different plants grew, and other animals behaved in different ways. And because of that, next time the river came up, it, it followed a different path. And because of that, the river changed course. And so, and, and when I when I proposed slightly provocatively that we should do the same to sex. Um, it was with essentially the same, you know, drawing a parallel there and, 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 and arguing that um, our sexual ecologies have become so depleted and so polluted um, that, the un that the only way to restore them to something like a, a functioning holistic health will be to take a look at the entire system um, and including reintroducing the, figuratively the apex predator, which is to say, the what sex is for, which is the the, 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 the the meaningful possibility of pregnancy. This stems from a much a much larger analysis I've made of the role played by um, fertility technologies, but really started starting with birth control in in a very much wider um, shift in our social ecologies. Um, that's, that's probably too 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 enormous to sum up succinctly. Um, but but I mean at, at the risk of trying to sum up, um, it's, my, it's my view that the, the contraceptive pill function served as the... <laughs> oh, Pico, do you want to go and join in the game? I think he does. I think he does, yeah. Go on, lie down. Poor Pico. Mm. Maybe I need to call the yellow dog over and stop her. Oh, no, they're, they're, mm. having, <laughs> they're having a happy game of splat, whatever. Um, the, the, the contraceptive pill was the first transhumanist moment. Yeah. Um, the, first, the first proper serious mass adoption. Um, moment where we embraced the transhumanist order and I mean I, I didn't spell it out quite in those terms in the book it was only really afterwards that I realized that what, what I've termed the cyborg era is just is just another way of saying the transhumanist era mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and the reason it's such a significant moment um, culturally is because that's the first time we've um, we've embraced uh, medical technology um, whose purpose is not to fix something that's broken but to break something that's working normally um, which is an incredibly significant psycho um, cultural shift. I know. It's an incredibly significant shift because um, it's it, it completely inverts the the historical purpose mm -hmm. of medicine. Sure. Everything else which has followed since then, um, you know, taking us further down the the path of terraforming ourselves, for example, through um, fertility technologies. I mean, there's a whole whole panoply of those now. The, 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 in a sense, in, you know, what, I, what I think of as the commodification of ourselves, and which interests me in particular as a feminist, because the commodification of ourselves turns so often and so centrally on the commodification of women, because women are the, are the fount of new life. You know, only, only women can make babies. Um, and as, as, the, as the fount of new life, you know, the, I mean, what, what, and it, it, it's, like, it, it's like the alchemist's fantasy of being able to turn lead into gold. You know, the... the, the it, the, the, the fantasy that we might be able to create new life without having to ask women nicely is, you know, for, 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 a, for at least a subset of men, I think has, is, as in, is as enthralling and as enticing. But you can through technology, right? Well, or, 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 and well through, that's the dream. Through, through money, <clears throat> if you pay people to do it. That's the dream. Downstream of this transhumanist moment where we accept it in principle that it's not only, well, it's not only good but feminist um, to use technology to interrupt our, our reproductive, our normal reproductive... Uh, functioning, it's led on, you know, as, as slopes of this of this uh, lack of friction um, tend to, uh, to to a whole host of other related technologies, which say, you know, it's 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 fine and legitimate to to extend uh, medical intervention into the domain of um, conception.
It's, it's legitimate to, domain, to, to extend technology and with it commerce into the domain of gestation. Um, so, and, and, then, yeah, and then you're looking at the IVF industries, you're looking at assorted other fertility-related technologies, you're looking at the commercial surrogacy industry, which fortunately, as yet, touch wood, we still don't have in the United Kingdom, but they're on manoeuvres, because of course they're on manoeuvres, um, because, of, because there's, a, there's a market for it, bluntly. Um, there, is a, there, is a, there is a deregulatory move afoot, even as we speak, that's being driven by a government-funded quango to tilt the presumptions in certain British surrogacy law away from the birthing mother and towards the quote-unquote commissioning parents. If anybody's watching this and it hasn't, it has, nothing's changed yet, I urge you to write to your MP about it. <laughs> um, um, but but these things these things are all downstream of having accepted initially in principle that it's legitimate to to break something which is functioning normally in the interests of individual human freedom. When um, when Roger Scruton in the 1980s I think maybe it was 1980 um, wrote his book Sexual Desire he really privileged the whole concept of the sacred in protecting the sexual sphere. I'm not sure it's, ha <laughs> it's had many practical effects in the, <laughs> in the wider culture, but is that, is that where you would place a recovery of the place of sex in society, taking it out of the purely rec recreational paradigm and resituating it as I mean, a, as to, a to be honest I've self. argued I've argued it in much in much less much less theoretical terms uh, much more much more concretely um, in the, la the last chapter of feminism against progress I made I made the feminist case against birth control yeah which may from from a sort of immediately post 1960s point of view may strike so many people as counterintuitive um, you know given that mm -hmm. given that so much feminist effort um, from the second wave onwards has, has been really has, has really turned on. But um, in the age in which we live, you've received surprisingly little pushback. I, I have been genuinely surprised that most of the people who push back really hard on, on the idea that there might be a feminist case against birth control tend to be boomers. Boomers? Yeah, they mm. tend to be boomers, which stands to reason, I suppose. Yeah. But I, I also hear from, from a lot of younger women, um, you know, some of whom were put on, put on the pill at extremely young ages, you know, 14 or whatever. And, you know, I know, I know I've, I've heard from women who spent a decade on it without really, really... Yeah, we really must have the first of those coming through now, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right, girls who were, put, who were put on the pill at very young age, essentially because their parents just didn't want to have to worry about unplanned pregnancies. And as a consequence have been sort of, you know, sterilised, you know, neutered and sexually available in a way which, you know, for some, for some such young women, they're beginning to think was not primarily in their interest. You know, it maybe benefited their parents because they didn't have the, the inconvenience of dealing with an un, a, a teenage you know, pregnancy. And it, pro and it almost certainly benefited all of the British teenage boys that um, had, had a measure of access that would otherwise have been mm. um, not, really, not really a possibility. But, but I think, you know, for, 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 most, for, for most of the women who I speak to who are expressing scepticism about birth control now, um, the primary driver is not some sort of, you know, highfalutin idea of sanctity or sanctity of sex or anything like that. It's just this really fucked me up. You know, I, I, ex I experienced a complete personality transplant when I came off the pill and yeah, I, yeah. I like myself a lot more now. <laughs> or um, I, I came off birth control having, having decided I want to settle down with, with my partner and have only just discovered that, the, that I had polycystic ovary sy ovarian syndrome this whole time. And if perhaps if I hadn't been on the pill, I would have figured out what was wrong with me much earlier. And you see, you know, this is this is not a this is not a, a complaint that that you're even that you even know exists, no. mm. right? And there are a great many women who also don't know it exists. It's a over, it's an ovarian disorder which can cause all which can cause all kinds of fertility issues, and which which is often treated routinely by GPs, especially in young women where they don't really know why they're having miserable time and heavy periods and whatever. It's it's often routinely treated by just putting them on the pill, which right. masks yeah. the symptoms. Yeah. Yeah. And then means that, that, that PCOS goes un undiagnosed and untreated for years and years and years. And it's possible, you know, for example, in, in the case of the, the woman I was speaking to about this, that you, you, can, you can only discover that you have, this, you have this syndrome at the point where, in fact, you're ready to start a family. And then you've got a whole load of other, a whole load of other problems that you have yeah, to right, deal exactly. with. Amazing. Exactly. There's, a, there's a huge and complex picture of, 
you know, what happens when you when you sever women from any kind of intimate familiarity with our own reproductive cycles, and the you know the inf the, the complex consequences that, that that can have, whether it's for women's mental well, for the for the mental health of young women. Yeah. I, I, if I remember rightly, there's a there's a dis, there's a clear link be between incidences of depression and being on the pill. Pretty much every woman I've ever spoken to about having been on the pill tells them that, that, that it gave them it, it made their moods go weird. I mean, right. I, I, I was on the pill, I think, for about two, three years when I was in my late teens. Um, maybe it wasn't that long, but it, it was long enough to realise that it made me fat and mad and sexless. <laughs> you know, it just made me, made me completely, completely crazy. And yet, um, the principal benefit is that you can have casual sex. Yes. Um, so essentially, you're, you're, we're, we're routinely giving, giving young women this medication that makes them fat and mad and, and wrecks their libido. It interrupts their ability to familiarise themselves with their own reproductive cycles and in some cases masks serious fertility issues until it's almost too late to do anything about it. And we're doing that principally so that they can have casual sex where they maybe have a 10% chance of an orgasm. Like, who is really benefiting here? I'm not totally, I'm not entirely convinced that it's the women. And even then, the orgasm might be great, but, but the overall sense of happiness and flourishing and a sense of right. self-realisation is... And, and this, is, yeah. this is before we even get into the wider downsides of what the, the, the contraceptive paradigm introduces into our sexual ecologies. Right. Um, you know, which is a, a, whole, a whole litany of wider sociological ills, you know, which all, which all stem from um, accepting as a default that sex is a kind of fun, consequence-free leisure activity. Um, I can well, see why Catholics like you. <laughs> <laughs> the bottom line is that we can, you know, there may be a minority for whom sex genuinely is a fun, consequence-free leisure activity, but those people are, of both sexes are a minority, and they're even rarer among women than they are among men. You know, there's a whole, a whole litany of articles out there in magazines aimed at women, um, which, which offer guides to young women on how not to, I quote, catch feelings when you have oh, casual wow. sex. I wow. know, how miserable. You know, the whole point of having sex is catching feelings. Like, you know, that's what it's for. You know, it's for bonding and it's for, and it's for, it's for having kids. That's what it's for. And there's this idea that you're, you're supposed to, it's somehow, your, your, it's somehow your duty and your obligation as a mature person to figure out how to how to do this thing without doing the thing that it's for. It's just mental. And all of this, all of this is underwritten by the by the sort of technological substrate of, 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 of the contraceptive paradigm. And and to me I think I think there's a robust uh, feminist case that you can make for, for women saying no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to honour my own fertility and I'm going to honour my own reproductive realities. And I'm going to honour the fact that I want and need um, intimacy only in the context of intimacy mm -hmm. i mean that seems it's it's kind of a no-brainer from where i'm sitting um i mean i, sh I should say at this point I, as, a, as a by by means by way of clarification that I, I should underline the fact that you know saying saying you're going to you're going to refuse birth control implies a significant degree of impulse control like the the tensions between um, the meaningful risk of pregnancy and the and people's capacity for impulse control and people's horniness is just kind of an enduring fact of human nature. You know, that people have at different times in history managed in different ways. You're very close to making an argument that sex only really works in the context of marriage. It's difficult to dispute that from, from women's point of view. If you accept in principle the idea that intimacy in, intimacy should should come with intimacy then holding out for intimacy is is, is is not not the craziest idea in the world. I mean, there's a there's a there are some there are some related coordination problems if you kind of if you're trying to do that from where we are now. Funnily enough, or perhaps not so funnily enough, mostly Catholic, um, but you know, women who are mostly mostly religious young women who are keen to eschew the the contraceptive paradigm, um, and who, as a consequence, you know, that, that that's just not the world that we live in for the most part. Um, find themselves find themselves short of uh, potential dates. It's ter terribly difficult for men because uh, I know a number of men who would love to be able to walk up to a young lady and ask her, you know, to dinner or, or for for a drink at the pub or whatever, and, and um, but they don't feel that they can do so with the expectation that they'll be turned down with manners because there's been such a breakdown in the way that we just relate to each other. Um, and of course, 
that's been exacerbated by on online ways of discussion, which which are routinely adversarial. Um, that that you just can't count on being treated in a mannerly way uh, when being turned down, um, and so the the risk is too high. The the the, the um, the kind of confidence that's required in a young man uh, to wander up to a girl and and m- make such a kind of humble proposal, um, particularly if you've been told repeatedly that your masculinity might might be a source of all cultural and social toxicity, uh, is <laughs> you, you know you. what reserves do you have <laughs> to yeah. fall back on? Um, yeah, I've, I've I've speculated on occasions that. Um, that at least some of the sort of now quite kind of generalised public anxiety about quote unquote street harassment and things of that nature is downstream of internet dating in the sense that you know sexual tension between men and women is just almost like, it's so it's become so normalised for that only to occur in a kind of pre-designated context only mm-hmm. that when you encounter it in the wild it just feels bizarre and frightening. Right. I was a teenager pre-internet. We got, we got our first internet connection. It wasn't a very good one when I was 19. I can remember being hollowed by randoms on the street, and you didn't, you know, it was often annoying. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, often unwelcoming. Unwelcome. But um, it, was, it wasn't usually frightening. Right. It was just annoying. Um, and this idea that street harassment is somehow a sort of profound violation of my, I, I don't know, it's something, something sort of intimidating that will yeah. kind of you know, drive, drive me from public view seems, feels very strange to me mm. because I grew up in such a different context. Um, but I think if I, were, if I were 15 or 16 now, or 18 or whatever, young and hot, which I'm not anymore, um, but if I were young and hot now um, and, and I were accustomed to the idea that flirting only happens when everybody's agreed in advance that this is a flirting space because on internet dating is how people find themselves in that space in the first place, then you know, if, if some, some horny rando approached me on the street, I'd probably find it terrifying. Yeah. Because it's so yeah. completely unfamiliar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I yeah, mean, yeah. It's, you know, it's, it's sort of alarming enough as it is um, without <laughs> all of that. Uh, <laughs> the underlying point there is that um, sexual energy between men and women is inherently dangerous. There is no way around it. Right, that. yeah, yeah. Um, and in a sense, you know, perhaps... Because it the, can bring about a baby and change yeah, your entire life. And, and, and perhaps, and perhaps the central lie of the contraceptive paradigm is, is to, to pretend that we could, we, could have, we could use a technology to make that danger go away. It's a safe zone. And it's just not true. Um, because all it, all it ever really does is displace the danger. And all it ever really does is displace um, those ways in which, um, you know, our nature comes to the fore in those intimate encounters. Do you think the, the rise of violence in pornographic material may be a kind of weird um, attempt to p- put the danger back into sex? Yeah, I, I, do, I do pretty much think that. I mean, I can't prove it. No, sure. Um, I, I can't prove it. But I, I think well, we're I all this, interpreting. I, I, yeah. I think I said this in the book. I'd be willing to bet that if, if, we did, if we genuinely succeeded in rewilding sex, most of the current fashion for BDSM would just fall away. <laughs> because because the danger the danger and the violence or, or, the, or the, the possibility for meaningful physical transformation let's say rather than violence um, the, the 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 scope for danger and you know transformative impact uh, would be back where it belongs. Well, that's, it is interesting because um, Foucault, who obviously kind of uh, died wasting away in the flesh pots of Paris uh, right. after. Uh, undergoing his very uh, baroque sexual experiences, um, uh, he he uh, well perhaps that's too flippant because of course he was supposedly traveling traveling to uh, North Africa to 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 have those sorts of experiences with children as well. Um, but apparently, one of the last things he wrote in his journal was. Um, pleasure is hell <laughs> right. um, you know that he had he always thought I think that on the far side of some new experience his appetite for pleasure would finally be satiated and instead he just found himself thirsty I yeah. suppose yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, isn't there a circle of Dante's hell which is just composed of people who can never be satisfied 
But well, maybe that does sound but, very but, Dante. But, yeah. but I'm, I'm pretty sure that Dante, Dante gave those guys a whole circle of hell. <laughs> but isn't that all of us? I mean, I mean, I, I've, I've rather come to the opinion that part of being a mature human being is to accept that your appetite for pleasure will never be satisfied. And so you have to live in a state of longing, mm. and that's that's what it, that's what it is to be a good, healthy oh, human being. That's absolutely right. But re returning to the question of rewilding sex, um, I think there's a you can make a robust you can also make a robust case that repression, you no, know, not not in the or, or sublimation rather. You know, let's be let's try and be as technically precise yeah, as okay. possible for any of the Freudians watching this. Um, sublimation. Or the Puritans. Is, <laughs> that, that, that sublimation is not just. Um, civilizationally necessary, but it's also an accelerant for desire mm -hmm. in its proper place. In the sense that you know, if you're if you're jaded and porn sick, and um, you, you've re you've reached sort of you know the state, you know, the the erectile dysfunction of the chronic masturbator, then you probably aren't going to have a very satisfying sex life. You know, if if you are if in the, in the un unlikely event that you ever find yourself with a real human uh, partner for it, but. Um, there is the, the, there is at least the, at least more of a possibility that if you're able to govern and contain and discipline and direct your desires a bit more, not only will you have a bit more libidinal energy to, to direct into other creative projects, for for, for example self improvement or public service or whatever, but also when at, at that point where you do find uh, another person to do to do all of those things with, that you might you might actually have some inclination to do it. Yeah. I mean, it's, a, it's a, just a thought. Well, what if the really terrifying thing happens, that you find someone uh, to do all of those things with, and then you find that you actually care about the person? I, I mean, perish the thought. <laughs> <laughs> so it sounds to me like, um, and it's lucky we're, we're making this uh, discussion for the European Conservative, because it sounds to me like, in your very kind of modern, avant-garde way of analysing things, you're actually trying to bring people home to a tradition-based conception of how to live, live one's life and treat one another. The, the old ways endure for a reason, um, which is never to say that we shouldn't re-examine how we do things in the light of how the world is now. I mean, it, it's rare to find um, a serious thinker on the question of tradition who doesn't acknowledge that sometimes things have to give way. Sure. Um, or, or, or That's be, part of tradition. Or, or, or be redeveloped in the context mm. of a... Of a of something which something fundamental which has changed. Yes, I don't think. I, I mean, I think it, there are those who would say, well, we need to rethink the tradition, our, our traditions around sex, because we have this. We're aware in this new, brave new world of technology. To which I suppose I'd, I'd say, um, maybe, but we're not infinitely malle malleable, and a lot of the things we imagined we can do, we could do with this technology, we can't. You know, we can't completely level the usual slight differences in mate selecting behaviour between men and women because it well, or at least it hasn't 50 years on it hasn't yeah. happened yet yeah you know men men still incline in this way and women still incline in that way even if there's a lot of overlap yeah um, nor have we completely abolished the possibility of accidental pregnancy nor have we nor have we got, gotten rid of the fact that humans humans come into distinct sexed physiologies yeah no, none, none of these things have been abolished they've only really been displaced well as you and say commercialized. The, mo the moment you introduce a new technology in order to conquer nature nature comes flying through the back yeah. door yeah yeah yeah. you um, can you can drive her out with a pitchfork as horace said horace yeah and, and that's still right. and still she comes back having a chat with Ian McGillchrist up on the Isle of Skye, uh, he said to me that the one question he always hates when he's kind of mapped out the problems and so on, someone inevitably puts up their hand and says, well, what do we do? Mm. Um, and he says, well, hold on a minute. Uh, the job of the philosopher, contra Marx, is, is to interpret the world, not to change it. Um, but, you know, a lot of the points that you raise do kind of lend themselves to that question. I mean, if what you're saying about, um, about relationships, about the dangers of contraceptive technologies, about all of this, if all of that's true, 
what practical measures can be taken in order to respond to what, what you describe as a pretty serious situation, a total so social transformation? The answer depends a little bit on what end of the telescope you're looking at it from. Um, a recent hostile review of Feminism Against Progress complained that my that the, the proposals I put forward were very quietist and individualist um, for, for the, the scale of the structural issues which I'd set up. Um, in the afterword to the book, I, I, I spoke directly to that and to the fact that I, you know, I hadn't spent a great deal of time on large scale uh, on the bigger picture and explained some of the reasons for that. One of the reasons why I is, is straightforwardly just the, because the bigger picture is very big, you know. But once you're into the bigger picture of, of how, where we go from here, you've got to deal with variables like climate change, and you've got to deal with variables like the, the fact that all politics is now post-liberal. Mm -hmm. um, and you've got to deal, you know, particularly with the, the concatenating effects of the digital revolution in our discourse and in our politics. Um, and so, and, and, and the, the answer to the question, what is to be done at the big scale, you know, at the policy level, you know, depends, you know, hangs, hangs to a great deal off some, some unknowns on, on, in, in, in those sorts of domains, which are just beyond the scope of a 50,000 word book, which is why I, I, I took a fairly kind of quietist um, approach. And, and, the, and the second reason I took a, a fairly sort of quietist, small, granular, um, high resolution approach was, was also um, as a matter of personal conviction. I mean, the, 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 the feminists of the second wave were fond of claiming that the personal is political. And I think you might also say that the political is personal. And I don't, I'm, I don't believe um, that it's, you know, in, or, in, order to, in order to take a stance on, on the world as it is, you have necessarily to go and, be, go and become an MP or, you know, sort of you create GoFundMes or whatever. Um, you can be the change you want to see in the world just, just in the way you live your life. Um, you know, which, which doesn't obviate the need, obviously, for large scale, you know, for, to push for structural change. But, but it's it's also it's also meaningful. Um, and I, you know, I, I I resist quite forcefully the the idea that that people's lives are meaningless unless they achieve unless they, they appear in the history books. I just think that's a, that's false and and agreed. Malignant. Agreed. But, but um, in terms of the, the the small scale, the the granular level, um, I think. I mean, I've, 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 made, I've made the case for re, re, completely re-grounding re how we understand marriage um, in the sense that I, 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 I think we need, we, we need a more pragmatic foundation for solidarity between the sexes than, than, than the sort of romantic idea of being able to find complete fulfilment in another person. Um, and I think if we're, if we're into the era of peak pro, uh, beyond peak progress, which, mm. which I really do believe, sure. um, you know, if, if progress really is just energy throughput, um, then you know, the, the end of fossil fuels is going to be the end of progress. And, that, and, and actually one of the books, I, the, the Feminism Against Progress was originally going to be a book about um, the, the, the tensions between the environmental movement and the feminist movement, um, which, which seem, still seem obvious to me. Sure. But, um, nobody wanted to buy that book, as it turned out. Maybe they're, <laughs> maybe, maybe they're just not. You know, I think the publishing industry just doesn't really want to doesn't really want to think about that at the moment. They will in due course because it's, it will become more obvious in due course. Um, the point where people start agitating to ban disposable nappies, yeah. um, feminism is going to arrive at quite an interesting juncture. Yeah. yeah in the in the the sort of chaotic and confusing and increasingly sort of in unpredictable times that we find ourselves in in the the, the age after peak progress um, I don't th I, I, I think it will become increasingly true that there isn't anything very sure that we'll be able to rely on apart from if we're lucky one another um, which 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 requires um, a specific mindset when it comes to forming lasting bonds you know, and, and this is particularly the case for women who want to be mothers. Um, you know, it's, it's demonstrably, measurably, you know, well documentedly true that women who are mothers flourish to the extent that they're well supported. Um, and you, you know, while you know, there are lots of different ways that a marriage can go wrong. It's also more often true than not that you're likely to be well supported where, where you have a, a, a partner around who cares for you and is, is willing to show up for you. But none of which is to say that, you know, abuse doesn't happen in marriages, which of course it does. Um, but more often than not, that's not what happens. Most people would obviously agree that uh, whatever you want to see in the world, you ought to embody that thing.
um, uh, you ought to live that. But what you're saying is that we should not be looking to top-down solutions to the situation that we're facing. No, I'm just saying that that's a different book. <laughs> right, OK, fine. fine. Um, I, I'm saying it's beyond the scope of Feminism Against Progress to try and write the, my, my proposed book of top-down policy yeah, interventions. Yeah, fine. I think, you're, I think you're drinking my glass of wine now. Oh, sorry, uh, sorry. I'm not sure what happens uh, to I'll always just reach for something. No, no, I mean, the, the, we, the, we can share it. No, 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 you tuck in. I don't the, have COVID, I promise. The, <laughs> <laughs> have, you, have you read, I wanted to ask you, have you read the Xeno Feminist Manifesto? I think so. Yeah. Really, so I, think I've, I think I've looked at it and it may, it, yeah. Okay, I'm familiar, but, I, I know. I mean, I read it recently and the thesis of... Uh, the 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 Zeno uh, feminist manifesto is is essentially that um, that technology is going to be the ultimate liberator from every aspect of uh, the tyrannical patriarchy, not just uh, in terms of um, it, it, how it has formed us socially, but also <clears throat> it's. It, are the very concepts with which we think about the world have been structured by this uh, tyranny. And, and through technologies, we're going to liberate ourselves from every aspect of it. So we're eventually, through technology, going to become that thing that we couldn't even understand now because we're already operating with the concepts of the enemy. And so we're going to become something we know not what. I think most of the xenofeminists have killed themselves. <laughs> I, mean, I, think, I think it kind of leads to misery. But your, your entire, whatever your, rat, uh, whatever your reactionary feminism is, it seems to offer a very, very different species of feminism. Right. I mean, I, mean, I would say, you know, if, it, where, whereas they would look at me and say, your, 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 your whatever feminism isn't, I would look at them and say, no, 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 actually, the, the, you know, we're, we're, we're like that Spider-Man meme where we're all pointing right. at each other saying, you know, you're the enemy of feminism. Right. Um, and I think, I mean, my, my, my argument is that we, we, we try and use technology to liberate ourselves from the givens of our, of our nature or from of our, our environment or whatever. And invariably what happens is that we, all, the, all, all that we do is we, is we liquefy the established norms that we use to manage the limit, our limitations and our givens in that way, and and, reor and reorder the givens themselves to the to the market. That's 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 all it ever does. Sure, sure. And so what I, what I suppose I would put to the Zeno feminists is that you think you're going to liberate us, um, all of us, from from the the, the nightmare uh, uh, impositions of the patriarchy. But all all we're, all we're actually going to end up doing is um, is reordering all of those givens to the market. You know, and what what you, and I mean, you know, it's you you point at pretty much every every form of patriarchy smashing which has been attempted since the second wave, and you will be able to find a way that whatever it was that they were doing their best to smash has found a way to come back, um, but it's it just in some sort of marketized form, you know, even down to the sort of you know basic kind of male chauvinist piggery, you know, all of the all all of the sort of sexist stereotypes in toys which they did their best to abolish in the 1970s and 1980s have just come back you know as a, a, a the, through through the through the commercial imperatives through the in incentives of, of being able to sell more types of stuff to more people yeah you know they you know, pink and blue toy aisles aren't you know haven't been abolished they've just been reordered to the market um, and I mean, yeah, and that's that's a that's a fairly kind of frivolous example, but I can think of some more sort of grotesque ones as well. But 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 really, just to illustrate um, how how futile an exercise um, trying to abolish our givens through technology is. I mean, you know, to take a to take a slightly more kind of visceral example, um, you know, the the, the 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 sexual utopians who came after the pill. Um, imagined that we'd be able to, we, we could do, we could use it to do away with the sexual double standard, and we could use it to do away with those those sexist asymmetries in how men and women approach um, sexual intimacy. And and all all that's happened is that all of the all of the characteristic differences between men and women have just become reordered to the market. So so no, in, in, instead of in, instead of women women withholding sex in because they were holding out for marriage, now you have now, now you have a sort of marketised ecosystem of sugar daddies, you know, which is which is essentially essentially the same thing except just grotesque grotesquely caricatured, and and turned into a kind of brutish transaction, you know, whereas before you know it always yeah. 
Yeah, it was it was at least cushioned by in mo in more cases than not, you know, some 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 measure of kind of um, you know, unspoken effort to balance the the, the, the material and the uh, the emotional. So the the, uh, the the toy example is quite an interesting one. Um, how? What about gay toys? What about what about gay toys? Well, gay toys don't have a sexuality. Would no, they? no, no. But but uh, there there has been a gaying of toys. Have you not noticed? The the rainbow unicorns absolutely everywhere. The uh, there's been this incredible move to take the drag queen aesthetic and impose it onto children's toys. I'm not completely convinced that this is a sort of this is kind of a stonewall driven conspiracy. I honestly just think uh, little girls like sparkly stuff and bright colors. They only started liking it yesterday since they appeared in the shops absolutely everywhere. In fact, almost perfectly coinciding with a huge attempt to um, uh, retrain children in uh, the maxims of the sexual revolution. Is that really true, though? I mean, I, I had... I, I remember Care Bears. Um, yeah. I remember Care Bears when I was a kid. Yeah, me too. You know, and I'm, yeah. I'm middle-aged, and, you know, there were sort of rainbow, rainbow sparkly Care Bears back yeah. then. You know, this is... Oh, I don't think they were, they were... But you don't need to think of this in conspiratorial terms. When, when the bourgeois ideal of the nuclear family was the social norm, you had little dolls' houses, little bourgeois households, you had lace dresses, you had all of that. And now the, the ultimate vision of the flourishing human being is this sexually liberated experimental uh, individual. You, you simultaneously have toys that have adopted the entire aesthetic of that movement. It doesn't need to be in conspiratorial terms, it's just w whatever our vision is of the summit of human experience and, and, and a fulfilled life, we will place onto however we're going to form kids popularly. Yeah, I think, I think that's probably true, but equally in terms, of, in terms of the point which I set out to make, which is that it doesn't matter how hard we try and abolish our nature, it will find a way of coming back, and it might come back in caricatured form, um, reordered to the market, but it will come back. Um, and that and that applies as well. You know. um, yeah, I, I, I don't think I don't think that's contradicted in any way by the by sort of by, by an explosion in gender neutral rainbow rainbow ish toys. <laughs> you know, because I mean, I, I, I'm not I, I remain unconvinced that that's going to translate in real life to any um, like it, it's it's not going to mean children grow up genuinely you know genuinely gender neutral you know they're just going to grow up conflicted about their their biology which sure. is demonstrably happening but it, that, that doesn't alter their biology no <laughs> sure the point no I'm no no making. sure sure so if you could tell the viewers and the readers uh, of the european conservative one thing i mean people people are people are, are, are are reading our journal and they're watching our material because they have questions gen I mean it's a very broad scoping journal they have questions that are civilizational questions they want to know one how to be inducted into their own civilizational inheritance and two how to save what's left of it um, for the future and, and their their life's project and their children and so on if you could tell them one thing what would you say it starts with the family it all starts with the family it all starts with solidarity between the sexes over the long term for the flourishing of children. Everything else follows from that. You know, we, we, could, we, we could save all of the libraries and we could save all of the architecture and we could save all of the literature. And if our, if our, if our families don't survive as well, then what was any of it for? It all starts with the family. Everything. Is that any kind of family? What I'll say to that is that whatever kind of families we embrace, we should strive always to put the needs of children first. And that means a concrete and realistic assessment of what children's needs actually are, mm -hmm. which includes having preferably, wherever possible, to have a relationship with their mother and father. Because those are, those are at the end of the day, what are children's parents are. I, I won't press you any I think that's what I would say to that. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mary. It's been fun.